here today to tell you how to use the USB version of the Manage Switchboard Mapping Tool. The first step is taking your USB flash drive and plugging it into your computer. I've used this extension cord here. Plug it in and the computer recognizes the drive through the operating system. It works on any Windows version from Windows XP onward. After you've placed the USB drive in your computer, it will recognize it and then allow you to look at it with your preferred file management program. In this case, I've already opened up the drive and here's the directory. SPMAP is the most common. If you have NetScan Tools Pro, it's here. Then what you want to look for is this batch file which launches the switchport mapper or you can just double click on spmap.exe. A few things to note here. You have some other files. These are your databases. This is where all your data is actually saved and it's saved on the USB drive. So let's go ahead and launch the Manage Switch Port Mapping Tool. Now that you've started the Manage Switch Port Mapping Tool, the first thing you're going to want to do is to adjust the settings. You can't just type in an IP address. It's a read-only field. So you have to press the settings button for the switch. Now you can type in the IP address and an alias if you'd like. You can select the SNMP version. We'll just restrict ourselves to version 1 or 2 for this video. And then you need the read community name for that. If you're going to do version 3, you'd have to do these settings here. We'll put it back at 2. You don't need the right community name because the only reason you'd want to do that is to turn on and off a port. Otherwise, everything we do is read. So we can go ahead and use the default settings here and press OK. Now you can see the alias and the IP address appear there. If you happen to have a server or a router that you can grab ARP information from, you can do the same thing here. In this case, we're not going to do that, but the depending on your network, you'd probably want to do this, especially if you have a server or a router that has visibility into large parts of the network your switch deals with. So now what we're going to do is check, make sure all these four boxes are checked. We will look at the ping sweep editor and make sure that you are pinging a, a, at least a section of your subnet. In this case, we have a small subnet here, just a uh, old style class C, which has 254 IPs. And so we're going to, it's going to ping every one of those IPs. If you have a, like a 10 dot network, that subnet could be huge. So our default settings might be very large. And whenever you're moving the USB, you want to be sure to check the ping sweep list editor because the IP ranges that you find in your current network may be completely different than the last network, so be sure to check the IP range. And if you're on a network that's fairly large, you're going to want to check those ranges to make sure that they are only pinging what's actually valid in that range. You don't want to be pinging a subnet forever of a 10 dot. So we're going to go ahead and close this, and now we're ready to map the switch. What we're mapping right now is a small Cisco small business system switch. It's an eight port switch. And as you can see, it pulls up various things really quickly. You have the interface descriptions, the names. You have the alias, which is something a network administrator might type in explaining what the port is connected to. You have the interface type, the VLAN, status, the speed of the port, the duplex status. And then you have the MAC address of each device, the IP address, and the host name. And then you have the interface manufacturer based on the MAC address. And if you have LLDP or CDP information in the switch, in this case this is a Windows 8 machine, and Windows 8 uses LLDP. So you see the IP address, the MAC address of the Windows 8 machine. 
and then you see the last change time, how long it's been since something's changed on that port. So this particular machine has been up and operational for two hours and 53 minutes. Then you see the interface index. Those are the basic columns. You can add other columns by going to settings and tools and then selecting column order and visibility editor. But right here you have the active column list, but you can add all these other columns over here. Not all these columns will work. For instance, if you're not using a Cisco switch, these Cisco MIB information columns will not show up. But Armon will show up, you know, from many different switches. So that's where you can change the column ordering as well. So if you don't want this column here, you can put it here, that sort of thing. You can right click and get many different options. You can lock columns, adjust column widths, um, refresh things. If you don't like the coloring, you can set the color all to white. You can search and copy single cells, rows, everything. You can export it to an XML file. So you can import it back into a spreadsheet like Excel or OpenOffice. You can print the grid. And like I mentioned earlier, if you have the right community name or right privileges, you can go ahead and enable or disable a selected port. Just watch it. Don't disable the port you're on. And then these are things for contacting the switch with Telnet, various things like that. And then you can show the switch mapping analysis in the web browser and get the properties of the switch this way. And under properties, you can see the switch address, uh, various parameters, model number, that sort of thing, what it supports as far as layers. In this case, it's a layer two only switch. A core switch like a Cisco 6509 will show layer three as well. And that's handy because you don't need to go in and fill in a server router one IP because that particular device contains lots of IPs. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. When a switch mapping is complete, your web browser presents a report. You can see in the report the time it was created, how long it took to map the switch. In this case, it was just 23 seconds. The version of our software that mapped it, the SNMP version, the IP address, and various parameters about the switch. You have a switch interface analysis, and I'll go over this in a little bit in detail. You have the number of interfaces, the number of active interfaces, the VLAN count, the number of Ethernet interfaces, and the number of unused. Now, by unused, we mean the port had no MAC address on it. Now, this could mean either there's nothing plugged into it or the attached device is off. Then you have the other types of interfaces. And then right here, you see the number of interfaces reporting MAC addresses. There were five. And we had two interfaces reporting multiple attached devices. What that is usually is a fan out from an, either an upstream or a downstream switch. And then right here, you can see the total number of MAC addresses reported by the switch. And then the IP address is found for the switch. So we come up with what's called a ratio of IP addresses to MAC addresses. 100% means that we found an IP address for every MAC address. But oftentimes, it'll be less than that. And so we'll go into a discussion about ARP tables shortly. If you have spanning tree, there's a report here. And based on historical data, you can see known routers and known switches attached to it. If there's a virtual machine found, based on the MAC address prefix, we tell you what port it's on. Right here, you see the summary of ARP tables. And as I mentioned earlier, if you have a layer two switch, layer two only, that means that all it's keeping track of is MAC addresses, no IP addresses. So we have to get the mapping from MAC to IP addresses somewhere. And so we get that using ARP tables. That comes from ping sweep, your local ARP, ARP table, the switch, and then those server router device right there. Then there's a timing report telling how fast everything was. And then it shows you where your working database and your history database are kept. That's a summary of the summary report. 
for the switch port mapping tool. You can turn this off in global settings. Let's talk about global settings. The settings you saw here before were device specific, which means they have only to do with the switch or the server router. So the global settings obviously are global for the whole program. Right here you see various things like automatically resize the column widths, do the post mapping analysis in the web browser that we just analyzed and talked about, enable a check for a new version. These are various things over here for the IP resolver and erasing tables on exit. Everything is kept in a database, so there are tables that don't need to be active all the time and should be erased when you exit, particularly the ARP table. And right here, remember we right clicked in the results and we saw options to contact the switch. Well, this is where you set the Telnet program, the secure shell, and serial program. Now we typically recommend putty or extra putty. And this button and this button will preset the paths and the parameters for those two programs. Right here you have MAC address limit per port is probably the most important thing. If you have a fan out of another switch, upstream or downstream, it may have hundreds of MAC addresses, especially if it's a large switch. So what we have is a limit right here which will limit what appears in the cell. It's preset to be 60. You can alter it right here. That's global settings. One thing we have in the program that allows you to quickly reselect the settings that you had for a switch or a device are these select config or select existing buttons. What they do is allow you to select a pre-entered device. So it brings up all the settings for the switch or the router. So you don't have to re-enter the settings every time. So you just hit select config or select existing to get this list and you can select from them and reuse them quickly. One of the most important features introduced in version 2 is the history database. What happens is every time you map a switch, all this information plus the properties of the switch are saved in a database. You can review the history right here. You have access to any manual mappings and what we've been showing you is a manual mapping or switch list mappings. We didn't cover switch lists in this particular video, but switch lists are a way to map a set of switches one after another and save their information to the history database for later review. So what happens is if you want to look at a particular mapping, I'm going to pull up one from several days ago, you just go over here and double click on it and it appears. Then you can right click and bring it back up, the properties. You can also show the you can show the switch mapping analysis in your web browser. And again in review history, you can do searching for a particular switch. Let's look for a MAC address that contains let's try a zero zero. So what happens is you find a list right here the interface name, the switch IP address, the time that it started, and the string that we found. In this case it has a 00, zero in it. We could have looked for an F1. And you can see the interface that F1 appeared on and the mappings that contained that in the switch IP address. So you can search for a particular MAC address or IP address across all your results in the history database. Then of course to view that you just double click right here and you can review the results as they appeared back when the switch was mapped. 
very handy for producing a report at a later time. And like I said, you can show the analysis in the web browser and get your properties here. This discussion is about the combined ARP table. As I mentioned earlier, switches typically only contain MAC addresses. They do not contain IP addresses, and certainly not host names. The host names are actually resolved from your DNS, by the way. But back to MAC addresses, what you have to do is find the IP address that goes with the MAC address. The only way to do that is with ARP tables. There's no magic find me an IP address given a MAC address protocol that you can send out over the internet. So what we do is we do several things. First of all, we query the switch's ARP table, which is generally small unless you're talking about a core router switch. Your local computer's ARP table, and then we do ping sweep, and we also get ARP tables from the server router one or two if you use both of those, either or both of those. Again, the ping sweep has to be adjusted depending on your local area network. I don't recommend going beyond your LAN. It can go to IPs outside of your LAN, but we won't be gathering any MAC addresses from that. In the database maintenance, you can see what happens. We build a combined ARP table, and the source of those particular IP and MAC addresses are shown here timestamp, what type of entry they are. If you have a lot of static IP addresses in your uh, particular network, you can import those static IP addresses right here. You can also add one manually right here if you have just one or two that you want to put in. But importing them is good for a large list, like if you have printers, things that don't change. You know the MAC address, you know the IP address, they're not going to be changing. So this is a good thing for those two entries. And you can see the combined ARP table. So what we do is we get the MAC address and we search for that MAC address in this table and we see the IP address. Back in global settings, we have an erase checkbox. And we erase that combined ARP table on exit. And if you want to erase the static, imports that you brought in, you can do it right here. But normally we just need to erase that one. It does not erase the static entries. This completes our overview of how to use the USB version of the Managed Switch Port Mapping Tool. If you want to refer to a document, a PDF document, you can either download it from the internet or you can go into the docs directory on the USB drive and look at the PDF manual. What you need to do after you're done with the USB version is properly exit it and then go down to your taskbar and eject the USB drive properly and make sure that it's fully ejected. Failure to do so could cause loss of data and possible damage to the USB drive.